Well, thanks for the intro. Thanks, Pete, for that um, great uh, intro from Abear, and it is fantastic that um, there's a positive outlook for Dairy Lee. So it's um, very exciting. I've been given a specific topic, and I've got a lot to get through. So I'm going to go a bit manic on you. So hang, hang on to your hat. So. Why is dairy an exciting investment opportunity? This is some data out of Euromonitor, which PepsiCo uses to back up their investment strategy into dairy. And PepsiCo is saying um, that dairy uh, consumption globally by 2020 will double any other food category. In fact, it's going to be double the next two biggest food categories put together. So when a company like PepsiCo says, we're going to invest in dairy because of this massive consumption story, uh, you should listen because they don't um, muck around. They don't do these things lightly. Um, Pete touched on this. This is the story of Chinese dairy imports. It's truly an, an, an amazing story, really what underpinning the story of dairy. So you go back to 2001, Chinese dairy imports just 309 million US dollars. You go to 2013, 6.2 billion dollars of dairy imports. A, a truly incredible growth story underpinning um, the future of the dairy industry. So, you know, demand side is all, all about China um, and other countries too, but um, China's such a huge story. Unfortunately, we haven't been in a position with supply growth to take advantage of it. The Kiwis with a free trade agreement have tended to grab a big market share in the Chinese powders in our market. Um, why is Peter so positive? What gets Abear positive? What gets us out of bed every morning? Well, it's this uh, recent pricing um, event, which has just been an unprecedented level of do uh, global demand for dairy. So you can see in about um, February last year, uh, things just turned for the sector. Supply got tight, demand got really strong. And look at that incredible run of pricing. If it hadn't have been for a high Aussie dollar, we would be paying much higher farm gate prices. As it is, we're going to get to nearly 50 cents a litre this year, which is almost our highest price ever at Murray Goulburn. So we're in the right place in Australia, we're in the right sector, and it's the right time, uh, truly a, a very exciting phase for Australian dairy to be going into, and we've got to make the most of it. <clears throat> I'm just going to talk about one small part of it. I just wanted to advertise Murray Goulburn a little bit more. Truly an incredible Australian business, the largest um, food, Australian owned food company basically of any type in Australia now. We'll, we'll do 3.2 billion litres. Right today, we're 35% of Australia's milk that we process. We're, gonna, we're forecasting $6.70 this year, which is 49 cents a litre. Hopefully, we can even do a, uh, slightly better, but that's what we're forecasting. We're currently at 6.53. Um, this year, Lee will get to about 2.8 billion. Uh, dollars in turnover, uh, about 50-50 de uh, domestic and, and retail, uh, and export, I should say. These are the big products we want to continue to sell. Infant formula is a massive opportunity for Australian dairy. We don't make enough infant formula. We want to make more, and infant nutrition. Um, butters and creams and spreads, uh, we want to do more of. Uh, blocked sliced cheese, uh, we make a lot of cheese, particularly up on the Murray River. And one of the things you didn't mention about the exciting period we've had in the dairy industry, Lee, over the last year is we signed the biggest retail agreement in history with Coles to do their daily pasteurised milk for the next 10 years in Melbourne and Sydney. And Norco did a similar deal uh, in, uh, in Brisbane. So we are moving big time into fresh daily pasteurised uh, as of the 1st of July when our Sydney and Melbourne factories will be finished. Okay, that's all background. Um, we've got a strategy primarily. So let's talk about growth. Um, the number one thing we need is milk supply growth. Uh, you know, really, these opportunities are there now, Pete, as you said, but we've got to have the milk advantage of it. So how do we pass that confidence back down the supply chain to the farm sector? Obviously, we're a co-op. Our objective is to do a lot of things within our factory, um, within our company, to increase the milk price. Our objective is to increase it by a dollar a kilo milk solids, which is about seven cents year in, year out. So if the milk price issue is 50 cents, for example, Lee, our objective is to get it to 57. If the market pushes the price down to 40, we want to be at 47. So we want to put that permanent dollar a kilo through cost savings and innovation into our milk price. So that's our objective. Now that's primarily how we'll drive growth. 
you know, confidence through the milk price. That's the primary objective. However, there's another few issues at play. Um, and I want to go into that, and that's capital on farm. So we've been going backwards, as you know, through a series of factors. We haven't paid a high enough price. Uh, there's been, obviously, ad adverse weather conditions. And we've gone backwards as a, as a milk supply at a rate of 1.7% a year. New Zealand, in contrast, has gone up at 3.5% a year. You know, when you look at it at 3.5%, it doesn't sound that much, but compound growth at those rates has a massive effect. So if you go back to 2002, we were 15% of world trade. The Kiwis were 30% of world trade. We've now dropped back to 7% of world trade. They've gone up to 37% of world trade. So we need to reverse this trend. That is an absolute must that we have to reverse this trend. Um, so what could it be? If we got, to, if we got back to um, just some sort of moderate or achievable growth similar to the Kiwis at 3.5%, we could take dairy exports to $5 billion by 2020. So that's the target, Pete. That's the sort of number we should be trying to get to. 3.5% compound growth in milk supply would mean we could do 5 billion litres of exports as a nation. I'm not just talking MG here. As a nation by 2020. Um, if we got back to, wanted to get back to 15% of global trade by uh, 2030, we could have $11 billion of dairy exports by 2030. Now, they're incredibly audacious goals, Lee. Incredibly. That would make us the biggest, probably, export sector um, in agriculture in Australia. But they're the sorts of numbers that we could achieve if we got back to 15% of world trade. Tr truly huge numbers and, and audacious goals. But what's been happening is what we don't want to see happen, and that is that land has actually been exiting dairy. So here's just some numbers out of ABS and out of the Victorian government that shows down the bottom here, you've actually had area of land equated to dairy actually going backwards. Now, none of it makes any sense intuitively, but that's what's happening for an industry with such a strong outlook. You know, we've, we've actually had less, la less land being compensated, as Pete said, by um, per cow production, for example. But we want to reverse this trend. We have to get land going back into, back into dairy production. Um, it's good for several reasons. One is, is you make more money doing it. You know, why has this land been exiting dairy? Uh, you know, it's a hard question to ask. But a lot of people cash out at retirement, sell their cows, potentially water, um, and unfortunately those assets are, are lost. They're essentially sort of semi-retired assets. Now, a lot of those assets are there under beef or sheep, waiting for someone to come along, reinvest in them back, back into dairy. Uh, it's an incredible prize if you can get people to invest in dairy again, because uh, I particularly love this number here, is that if you, could get the, the, if you could regain all of the lost land that we've lost in recent years back into dairy, uh, our analysis says that you would add $824 per person to everyone in Australia. So it's, a, it's an incredibly economic driver dairy because it does generate so much more income uh, per hectare than beef and sheep in particular, and most of that money Lee, is, in, is spent locally. So it's an incredible driver if you can get money back into dairy. A great case for government to be investing in this rather than uh, Qantas or the car industry. Um, so ANZ did a great um, report I think with Port Jackson Partners, which said, here's the range of things that are going to impact the growth of Australian agriculture, and one of them was capital. One of them was the source of capital. So that came out as a big issue, and we totally agree with ANZ in that analysis. Totally agree. So how much capital uh, do we need is a question. So if we're going to reverse this trend of milk production in Australia, A, we've got to pay more, we know that. Our dairy farmers tell us that every day, and we're setting about to do that, and we have to get more farm input going. But there's this big, big question of how do you do that and how do you fund it? How do you fund the growth of Australian agriculture? Do you <coughs> use debt, which is what's been happening for the last 100 years in Australian agriculture? Australian agriculture has been funded by families borrowing money. That has been the primary model, what, 99% of Australian agriculture, families borrowing money. And when you see the droughts hit and you see the volatility hit, that's when you know, really that model starts to stress. 
And that's what we're seeing. I think we've seen a big period of Australian agriculture where the debt-based agriculture model has really come under stress. So do we start to look at the alternative models where we use equity? And do we start to, to look at leasing in particular, which is the model we've looked at, rather than borrowing, to change the risk profile of agriculture and to change those structures? The other problem that the dairy probably has relative to the other industries is the day-to-day -day operation of large-scale farms. With cropping, for example, Lee, you can put someone on a tractor and they can do a pretty good job with massive equipment um, in, a, in a fairly structured way. You know, a 500 cow dairy farm or a 1,000 cow dairy farm is an ex extremely complex operation. Lots of animal health issues, lots of labour issues. Um, so it doesn't fit as well for corporate activity as what, say, uh, large scale broad acre agriculture does. So here's some massive challenges for us as a dairy sector to unlock capital, to unlock growth in what is such a prime sector, as Pete said. The ANZ report and what we've looked at says that the numbers are huge. If we were going to achieve that New Zealand target, we would need $16 billion of, uh, of equity. Sorry, if you're going to achieve, by 2020, if we were going to re regain our share of global supply, we would need $16 billion of investment in dairy. So truly a massive number in terms of just by 2020 getting to um, of being back at our previous share. If by 2025 we wanted to do it, you've got to double that number again. So if we're going to play this big role, this sort of 10 to 15 percent share of global trade, we're going to need the billions of dollars of money invested in dairy. And it's not surprising because, you know, when you start investing in land and you start investing in dairy capital, it, it is reasonably expensive um, investment. So these are huge numbers of capital. Now, can you expect mums and dads and families to borrow all of that money? Or I don't think you can in terms of the next generation of Australian agriculture. Um, how am I going for time? I've gone really quick. I'll go back and do it again. <laughs> so what are we doing? So we've launched this next generation package. Now the next generation package uh, was purely aimed at supporting expansion. Now we called it a young farmer package, but we don't put an age on it. So you and I are young, Lee, as well. We've put some supply finance structures in place. We've put like a, an old investment um, subsidy like you used to have in my rural finance days, which I beautifully borrowed off them and I've done for Murray Goulburn. So if you buy the farm next door and you borrow the money, we basically subsidise the interest cost. So it's really like a low interest rebate loan that we're doing for our farmers. We have a permanent, um, permanent uh, employment advisor on staff at Murray Goulburn who helps our farmers. So she's primarily doing 457 visas, Lee, because skilled workforce has been a for dairy. But the one I want to talk about here is called MG Partnerships, which is a, you know, uh, in external non-farm equity lease-based structure. So when we started to look at this issue of bringing capital into the dairy industry, we saw a few issues. We saw that it w there wasn't a lot of professional intermediation between the fund managers and the dairy farm sector. Um, people were coming to us and looking to invest, but they didn't know how. Um, they had become very gun-shy of operational risk in the dairy industry um, and, and in agriculture more generally. They were looking for counterparty risk reduction. They didn't necessarily want to deal with 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 individual farmers, Lee. You know, some of these guys are European super funds, so the last thing that they have in their skill set is how to deal with lots of individual farmers. Um, they wanted to have access to capital growth. Sorry, they wanted an underwritten rental return. They wanted access to capital growth. They wanted the best farmers, they wanted the best reporting services, they wanted to know that their assets were being looked after. And they wanted the potential for some liquidity. So they wanted the potential for the tenant to maybe buy the farm at the end of the lease term. So that's what we found was lacking in the inter intermediation between the dairy industry and the investment sector. Um, so we came up with this model called Murray Golden Partnership. So basically what, hap what happens is um, through a partner, uh, we found an investor. Um, that investor was out of Europe. Um, you know, it would have been great if they were an Australian super fund, um, but they were a European fund. 
we basically write a master head lease with them and our farmers, not us, but our farmers go out, they identify properties that they're interested in procuring as part of their dairy business and through a sort of an assessment process, uh, we work with the investor, we work with the farmer, we buy these properties and the investor then actually owns the property. We lease the property off the investor, we then sublease to our farmer. So all of those things that you saw in that previous chart, they're all addressed under our model. And we've actually done it. We've actually got this thing off the ground. So we've, we've, we did an initial $20 million pilot at Murray Goulburn. That's a pilot to us, $20 million. And that's exactly what it was. It was very successful. We very quickly had nine suppliers approach us to wanting to do nine farm projects. So we've done them. They're all now leased to farmers. So I'm the master lessee of these $20 million worth of properties. Sublease them to our farmers. They're predominantly in Northern Victoria and Western Victoria. We do have a farm in Gippsland. There's 28 million litres coming off these properties and there's a rental return for the investor. It's essentially a big dairy farm property trust um, in a master headless sea with Murray Goulburn. It's a very exciting project. We think it has a huge potential and uh, we, our plan is to make it a lot bigger. And I mean a lot, a lot bigger. So my key learnings in summary. Um, growth in Australian food production must be funded by a combination of debt and equity, as should business for that matter. You know, you, you don't find businesses 100% dependent on debt. It, it, it is a license to go broke or not to grow. You must have access to equity. And you know, when these farms get into trouble, Lee, they go to their banks and the banks often quite generously give them more debt. I think you know, that, that is often just making things worse. And I'm not criticising the banks, Neil, in saying that. The banks are incredibly supportive. But often that is just making it harder and you're rolling the dice again for a good year. If we had equity products as, a, as an alternative to debt products, I think agriculture would become much more sustainable. You know, if you, and you know, there's a whole range of things, including drought policy potentially, where equity could, I think, be used quite effectively. Um, it's very hard work doing this. For, for my colleagues and I who work in, you know, we work with lots of different companies in this space, but it's bloody hard work. The super funds are very conservative. They have high hurdle rates. They have, you know, finance committees and investment committees. It's very hard to get through them. We've been terribly gun shy on agriculture. We've had, we've had some disasters in agricultural investment in Australia, most notably the managed investment schemes. So, you know, getting super funds to support Australian agriculture is quite hard. So you do need these very structured um, professional models to get it to work. Um, so a lot of them, but a lot of them do want to invest. They come and they approach you and say, we do want to do it, we just don't know how. So more people are going to have to come up with things like MG partnerships to try and make it work. I mean, you know, this is not something that necessarily we wanted to do as core business for MG, but there was a big market failure there, Lee, and it just it was not being filled. Uh, counterparty risk was definitely something that was successful um, for us in the fact that the super funds, big companies like dealing with other big companies. And, and it's one of the golden rules of business. If you're in a big company, deal with other big companies. Um, and, you know, the super funds are much happier working with a 2.4 or 2.8 billion dollar Murray Goulburn than small sort of dollar shelf companies who've trying to raise a few dairy farm assets. So people want to work with MG, they bring the projects to us, we don't have to go looking for them. Experienced dairy farmers are the best people to operate the assets. I know there's been some um, successful corporate dairy farms, but in our view the best people to operate these assets are the experienced dairy farmers. There's no doubt in our minds. Murray Goulburn has no interest in operating or owning dairy farms. We just want to facilitate the use of equity to get into the dairy farmers' hands. It's really like an alternative finance model rather than a sort of corporate ownership model. Uh, the good thing about lease-based models is they're very scalable. So if you operate dairy farms, you know, you get to five or ten and Believe me, for those dairy farmers in the room, if you tried to run five or ten dairy farms, it's bloody hard to run five or ten dairy farms. Whereas if you use leasing, you can make these funds very big and you're basically using experienced dairy farms to lease the assets as part of their dairy businesses. 
So you could scale this up into the hundreds of millions of dollars. With that, Lee, um, that's one pathway that we see for capital to come into the sector. Um, you know, it's certainly a very innovative approach in our view and we've got it up and running now. Uh, and we hope that it gets bigger and bigger and helps us sort of meet some of that exciting growth uh, outlook that we have. So thanks for listening. I hope that wasn't too much to digest, but thanks.